What's up fellow gamers, Freak here, and patch 13.4 is on the way. For many of you, by the time you're watching this video, it is already live. I'm going to try to break from my usual for the last month or so and not have a two hour long patch rundown. Thing is, these patches are very, very large because I have had a hand in them ever since the beginning of the year. Uh, I've got extra context, extra stories to tell, but hopefully we can remain a little bit focused here. So 13.4 is happening. All right, great. A whole bunch of stuff is getting buffed and nerfed indeed. Some of this is follow-up from the support changes uh, that I helped ship in 13.3. Some of this is just we simply grabbed a bunch of tasks uh, as quick context around what we grabbed and when. Um, as always, on the Monday before patch lock, aka about 48 hours before patch lock, uh, we do a quick reaction to what happened in the previous patch. So getting data off of 13.3, what do we need to tweak based on that going on, or what has crept up as players continue to figure things out about the game and, and learn new behaviors and whatnot. And so uh, about half these things we grabbed um, on whatever last Monday, um, and about the other half of them roughly uh, was actually grabbed the week before where uh, we're starting to grab a lot of short-term work a bit earlier on where maybe it requires a bit more discussion than just what has to happen. Um, so anyway, there's some stuff grabbed from that as well. So let's talk about what we got into this patch. Um, first up is Ari. Um, this is a champion that tends to be very inoffensive when um, relatively high win rate. I think this is a champion that is exciting in pro play. She's an exciting overall cool champion. He's relatively fair. She has to kind of has to land charm to do her real job. And overall, um, though she is not the biggest champion in the game, I think it is very wise um, for game designers to kind of curate um, the healthiest champions into popularity. Um, I think... Just in general, that is a a overgeneralization platitude I'm going to submit that I think it is it is um, not only just fine but a good thing for well-meaning game designers to pick winners and pick losers. I think that is actually an appropriate thing to do. Um, Picking losers is often more a thing of players really frustrated about this, and it has to kind of get nerfed because of player frustration more so than just strictly overpowered. There's no reason to leave something bad and unbanned. Um, but in terms of, hey, you know, Ari is like fine-ish. She's like 48, 49% win rate. Like that's passable. It's like, no, she should be 50 and change. Uh, not 53 by any means, but again, just defending the fact that I think this is totally reasonable to do. Anyway, pretty minor buffs to Ari. Uh, they are somewhat high MR skewed. Um, because early laning phase tends to mean a lot, especially in pro play. What's interesting about armor, uh, so, so I think I think base health is um, relatively high MR skewed. Um, laning phase means more to really good players than it does to um, average players or or even bad players. Uh, because there's so many mistakes anyway in lower skilled games, it doesn't really matter who in the lane as much. Certainly it does matter, uh, but like, you know, two degrees, right? It, it's going to mean more in pro play. Now, what's interesting as well is armor is a sort of a different stat in this because in pro play, we see almost exclusively magic damage. Um, Ari, Silas, Victor, Corky, Azir, like all the things you actually see in pro play are all magic damage. We've had the occasional set and Renekton metagame, but it's been a long time since Zed has been a big mid laner. And so what's interesting is though pro players and high elo players are actually really good at using auto attacks to harass. And in fact, um, if you're going in and harassing, you're, you're playing LeBlanc, right? You W forward and you Q auto auto or auto Q auto, whatever. You have pulled minion aggro. Not only have you auto attacked the enemy champion twice, meaning that their armor mattered for two auto attacks for a hundred something outgoing damage at level one, it's 110. Um, it was 55 base AD on LeBlanc. I have that memorized by the way. Um, but also, you have pulled minion aggro to do so. Now, it was still correct as you as LeBlanc to go walk in and auto-attack someone and pull aggro, but it means that both going out and coming in, armor means a lot for pro play. Even in an AP versus AP matchup. Uh, however, if you look at solo queue, some of the most popular champions are Zed and Yasuo and Yone, who are physical damage champions, um, and unsurprisingly, armor really matters against Yasuo all in. So uh, armor does weirdly double duty for both solo queue and pro play. It's I think that's a relatively flatter stat. Um, anyway, base health is is more pro skewed because um, that affects the RE matchups as opposed to only the Zed ones and the RE matchups. Anyway, moving on. I don't want to spend too long on this one. 
Early game durability is up. It's actually a patch where there is a lot of base health and base armor changes. Also, 10 seconds off the R cooldown. So, uh, here is her health totals before and after. It's not a huge difference. It's up about, you know, 3 to 1%. If you factor in the armor uh, for her overall physical durability, it's up pretty substantially. So, uh, yeah, if you're actually against physical damage in the lane, aka you're pulling a lot of aggro, or you are against an AD champion in lane or whatever, it's a solid 6% more durability level 1, which is a pretty big deal here. Um, our cooldown, of course, down by 10 is not absolutely massive, but it is something. I think it's generally okay here, so nothing too exciting going on with that change, but great. Cool stuff to Ari. Uh, next up is Alistair. Um, this is me doing follow-up work off of the uh, support tank um, changes that I had a pretty big hand in shipping in the previous patch. Uh, I pretty exhaustively looked at the data from how Alistair was doing in soul lanes, how AP builds are doing in soul lanes, and... As far as I can tell, even though we have that clip of Showmaker playing AP Alistair, and that's cute and everything, he is not even close, as far as I can tell, to actually being a good mid laner, um, wizard cow or not. Um, so I think there is safely room to buff the AP ratios. Um, now, the reason I've been doing this at all is because I would like there to be a healthy healthy room for choice for Alistair to choose to go for stat shards instead of armor. That if he wants to say, you know what, this is a, a very low poke lane. I'm against Yumi, or I'm against Janna, or just someone who's not dealing much damage to me. I don't need to run the defensive stat shards. I can go ahead and run ability power. I can go ahead and run that and make that choice happen. I think that is healthy. It promotes some extra choice. Um, if Alistair didn't have a, a reason to ever even consider Shirelia's Reverie, and maybe now he can because um, the, or Battle Song, whatever, um, hey, you know, the ability power, I don't want it to feel like it goes to waste. And in general, this gets us to a fairly aggressive AP ratio where it's not going to go to waste. Um, because, yeah, I mean, I would like getting Baron buff to feel good. I would like your stat shards and your relic shield to feel good. I would like Infernal Drakes to feel good. Insofar as the champ is not going to be a problem, and AP Alistair is not going to be a problem, as far as I can tell, and again, I really did my due diligence here, um, unless some stuff is really lying to me data-wise, or, you know, secretly it's good, but no one's good at it yet, um, we're probably okay. So this is this is not meant to mean very, very much. Obviously, every 10 ability power is one more damage, which, to be fair, is stat shard plus relic shield. Um, and then as you finish, you know, Bulwark of the Mountain or whatever, you know, a little bit nicer. But again, not meant to be a huge deal. Just there to say, hey, you know what? I pulled my hedges a little bit. I was a little bit afraid in the previous patch, but I wanted to go AP ratios as high. Okay, it's not a problem. I can go the rest of the way. Um... I think it's reasonable to say, hey, I'm gonna try something pretty big. I'm gonna give him real AP ratios. Let's start a little gun shy. Okay, gut check. Okay, cool. We'll go the rest of the way. I think that's reasonable. I think it's... I'm actually kind of curious how you feel about it as well, just fellow viewers. Um, right? Like, it's probably more harmful if I say, yep, I'm going to go swing for the fences and ooh, I overshot and ooh, I broke stuff. And then say, you know what? I'll go a little bit gun shy. This shouldn't be a problem. Okay, yeah, follow up buff uh, for this kind of stuff. I think I think it's reasonable to do. Anyway, again, Wizard Cow probably not going to be actually good. Uh, this is just simply the fact that Alistair strictly lost win rate in the last patch. This was literally in support. Um, it didn't seem to be because people were running like bad stat shards. Maybe some of it could have been people who weren't good at Alistair playing Alistair. But overall, um, I knew coming in that I was nerfing his teammate healing with the changes in the previous patch. Um, I was buffing his self-healing. It was going to be roughly power neutral in lane and then weaker in team fights. And I figured, look, I'm lowering your mana costs. Your laning phase is otherwise kind of the same power level, uh, like aggregate regen wise. So yeah, maybe a small compensation nerf into your uh, team fights is okay. The fact that the healing is really high, like I think it's probably better for the champion. And then ended up just like being a winner right for the champion. It's like, okay, we're going to bring the healing, the team healing kind of back up where it was. Of course, the old value was just a flat scale per character level. This is based on his max health. And so the numbers are going to be a little bit different. It's going to you know be based on how well you're doing, how poorly you're doing. But to me, this is the kind of building that definitely should scale off his max health. I think it, it makes it feel more compelling. It makes it feel more interesting. You have a bit more choice. Like, ah, yes, if I buy a War Mogs, I heal my team for more. If I get Radiant Virtue, my health is higher. And I heal my team for more. And like those kind of hooks, I think are really compelling and interesting. And so I want to give hooks when appropriate, when it can make sense. And I think this does this pretty well. Anyway, again, this is roughly equal to pre-patch, but again, based on how well he's doing, it can still be lower, can be higher. Um, here's the math real quick. Um, here's the passive heal on his teammates. It's up 17% because, uh, or, you know, one six 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 percent because it's um, 
right? Six becomes seven, so duh, obvious math there. Um, here is how much damage his Q and W do if he's building uh, a lot of ability power. This is like 270 AP at level 18, which is, you know, a solid like three full items. Um, again, pretty unrealistic to play Wizard Cal, but yes, the damage is up a little bit higher. His his combos are up 200, you know, 27 damage each. Um, again, not expecting Wizard Cal to be good. I don't think we're close to that one, but here you go. It's a little bit less bad. Um, there was an interesting discussion to be had around should troll builds be remotely playable like i don't think i'm promising to players that wizard cow is good by him having ap ratios because every champion has ap ratios but if i'm like hey by the way um here's jungle darius his q has a monster mod look we tuned his jungle clear so that he's ostensibly a real champion right um and that to me says yeah we're actually trying to make jungle darius a thing or something kind of um and, you know, like Talon and Zed have these things as well. Echo has it to a certain degree. And it's like, that clearly means that as designers, we're choosing to make this champion somewhat viable in this role as opposed to it being an accident. And, well, yeah, you're it's 40% win rate to play AP Thresh mid. We're not telling you Thresh mid is a thing, right? Um, again, I don't think AP Thresh do that. I don't think they promise that kind of a build. Uh, but I'm kind of curious. I was like, no, actually, I'm going to try to make Wizard Cow a thing. Like, probably shouldn't be 50% win rate mid laner, you know? So I don't know. It's a random thought. I don't want to spend too long on this. But either way, again, Wizard Cow not very good. Passive heal up. Let's move on. Mumu is uh, someone that we picked up uh, on uh, short notice for this patch. This was one of the, the Monday pickups. Um, I took the change list because uh, Mumu is a champion that I play a fair bit of. He is definitely um, a quite strong jungler, especially um, in lower MMRs. Uh, before people say XD, Riot Special, Riot's nerfing Demonic Embrace in the jungle, we'll get to that a little bit later on. Um, I think by and large, the Demonic Embrace damage cap is incredibly irrelevant um it matters technically a little bit but i think the overall idea of what it's going to do to champions is really overblown from what i've seen from community interaction so um this is not a very big deal anyway um the memu is doing too well in jungle especially in lower mmrs generally speaking baseline scaling stats tend to be low mmr skewed uh, in terms of value uh there was some memu buffs a while ago that actually strictly buffed his health growth i think that was a mistake um but ultimately uh, armor growth down to four puts him at relatively the low end for melee champions and health growth down back below 100 puts him at the relatively low end for uh, melee champions as well. Ultimately, Amumu's kit is just so low elo skewed as a kit that without doing more work onto it, and to be fair, um, there has been good work done giving Amumu two Q charges and making his ultimate a stun instead of a non-auto attack route. This actually helped bridge the gap somewhat. Um, again, tr kind of like troughing his growth stats to what is comfortable. Um, I think does that a little bit as well. I'm doing similar something here with the W, um, where I'm I'm just trying to find the levers that are appropriate for this. Uh, this is actually version two of the change list. I initially had done some mana stuff, um, trying to say that, hey, you know, Amumu's going to run out of mana more often. Um, good players are better at managing their mana pools than, than weaker players. So if your late game mana pool is a bit scarier, like we lower your mana growth or your lower your mana regen growth, or we increase the mana cost of W and E a little bit. So once you walk out of the jungle you might oom in the fight like hey that's probably a low elo skewed nerf as well again generally speaking better players are better at using their mana pools um as, as an overall kind of rule of thumb uh that got shot down um i think for good reasons i think making him feel more mana starved can just make him uh kind of annoying to play and punishing to play and just saying, yeah, you're a bit squishier is, is a little bit safer here. So um, valuable feedback gotten from the team. Uh, so the growth stats are down, but also his uh, W rank up has gotten worse. It's now only 15.15% uh, max health per second per rank up instead of 0.25% uh, max health per second per rank up. This ends up being a moderate amount of damage down. So we can look at the uh, the data table here. So here is his health before and after. It's down a solid 4%. Of course, he's going to build demonic. He's going to build other things with health in them. He's you know going to have some decent stuff with it. Um, factoring in the armor growth here as well, uh, down only three armor it's not a huge nerf to keep in mind uh but it's uh you know six percent less you know physical durability so this will do something right it will be a nerf it's not a huge one i'm talking about one and a half percent win rate uh from this this is what it's kind of expected to be about one and a half percent win rate in low elo so we'll still be relatively strong uh the debbie rank up um it's actually worth noting that uh at current tuning at least for average players, ranking W second is appropriate. Just simply being a bigger damage ball is is better. Um, once again, if you're not going to do that, it's only going to nerf him from level 14 onwards, which, hey, by the way, your kit's base output at higher levels tends to be low elo skewed. So uh, pushing it around this way, um, I do think uh, there's room to further, like, 
just find a move nerfs in general and like make his early game better. Like if we could nerf a move by like three percent win rate, but buff his early clear a ton so that he's like actually a good early clear champion and a safe early clear champion, like that can raise his low elo or his his high elo stakes because his early game can be better. Um, there's like a bunch of stuff that you could possibly do to keep shifting a move around, but again, I'm not going for really really big work here. Just simply. Um, trying to lower things at an appropriate amount, and so the DPS and W certainly is significantly lower once you're done maxing out the ability. All right, going on the next one, which is going to be a Nivea. Um, I didn't have a hand on this one, but this was certainly a champ who was doing quite well. Uh, has done really, really well ever since the Roa and Seraphs upgrades, so she's doing really nicely. So health growth is down, armor growth is down. And Nivea is nowhere near a uh, pro problem. I have not looked if she is technically low MMR skewed or not, um, but in general, this champion is doing too well in generic solo queue and isn't in pro play. So, um, you know, don't find a nerf that's pro skewed. I think is a very reasonable choice here. So pretty simple tactics, exact same ones that I had on a move, by the way, which is health growth and armor growth. Um, though different designers did this, we picked the exact same levers because these are solo queue skewed levers, especially um, uh, low elo solo queue skewed levers. So 3% less health, 5% less durability if you count the armor as well. Pretty similar stuff here. We can kind of move on pretty quickly. Uh, Annie certainly doing too well uh, post... Um, What's it called? Post uh, post update. Uh, some stuff was interesting here because when 13.3 came out, there was a bug for the first 24 hours where after using a dash, uh, your auto attacks would kind of break. And so champs who didn't dash um, just like absurdly won at the start or at least didn't dash and auto attack. So it's like, oh, Aurelian Soul doesn't care about dashing and auto attacking. Annie literally can't dash. So she doesn't care about dashing and auto attacking. Um, but, like, champs like Yasuo got just freaking destroyed. Uh, and it turns out, like, Yasuo and Yone are really, really popular champions, so a bunch of mid laners got a bunch of free win rate off of their opponents being bugged. Um, so that got fixed really quickly, which is good. Um, but it meant that tracking any win rate data was weird. Uh, she got micro patch nerfed, as did Aurelian Soul after a couple of days after the data kind of settled. We're like, okay, no, they are doing too well. All right, ship micro patch. Um, cool stuff there, but a, another round of nerfs here for Annie, who is still doing too well post patch. And so, what's going on here? Well, uh, significantly less health, um, less reflect damage and molten shield. Worth noting that any support is definitely, as far as we can tell, pretty much S tier in pro play, um, or at least close to it. She's certainly very, very good. Uh, and the correct skill order for her in mid lane is actually to max E second. Most players haven't realized this yet, but the E is a really, really, really good ability. Turns out the E scales with itself because if your shield lasts longer, you have more potential targets to reflect damage to, right? It's actually a really, really big deal. Um, so E max is a second is, is actually really, really important. Uh, but anyway, retaliation damage is down somewhat, keeping the shield value a, a little bit. 10 seconds to 20 seconds increase on the tipper's cooldown. And again, the base health change here. So what is Annie losing? Well, she's losing six to one percent of health keep mind that she has a self shield so um in actual practice you know her base health is 60 higher on both halves of this that makes the percentage a little bit less severe but still a nerf a uh, reflection damage down a pretty substantial amount here to the tune of around 12 percent keep mind ap ratio didn't change so even though it goes from down five to down um 25 the ap ratio can carry back up to make the percentage change not quite so severe although still pretty solid reflection damage of course on this ability considering that it also still gives a shield it still gives move speed it's still very very strong look at the tippers cooldown real quick and um don't mind the colors i finally for the first like after three or four years of doing this kind of stuff i finally just put in um conditional formatting so that anytime the number is greater than one it just shows up as green and if it's less than one it shows up as red instead of manually coloring it every single time um this saves me hours um uh, over the course of a year. Uh, the only downside is things that say cooldown show up as green and things that show mana cost show up as the other way around as well. I'm willing to, it's a sacrifice I'm willing to give, you know, <laughs> you, you can deal with that. But anyway, cooldown of course substantially increased. So that is of course a nerf as well to Annie. So Felios, um, the tough thing with Felios is uh, because of how uniquely his abilities work, the way that they scale and whatnot, it just simply takes more time to do any given change to a Felios than any other champion. I think this is largely why a lot of Felios' changes have been to uh, base stats and scaling stats and really simple things like his QW and E rank ups. Um, because it's simply a lot harder to change Severum ultimate. And keep in mind that like, okay, I can nerf Severum, but he only uses Severum 20% of the time. And he only uses Severum Ultimate 20% or 0% of the time. Who knows? It's maybe not even up for him. Or it's never the right Ultimate, whatever, right? So it's like, it's really hard to get um, positive win rate change on a champion who doesn't even use that tool, you know, more than 20% of the time. Um, which is why so frequently we look at base stats and, and things that are going to be ubiquitous on a champion because it's a lot easier to do that than like 
fiddly 1% win rate nerf on red and green and white and purple and blue guns. Right? Like, I think there there, there can be a better designed version of Felios that, like, does stuff with his guns more and has more stuff going on. Like, that's completely reasonable to have that, that, that idea. But it literally takes longer and is riskier to have to change five things instead of one. Um, that said, I chose this change. Um, my first version was accepted as a reasonable change. Um, let's talk about why I did this. Um, so one of them is, hey, isn't I have clean numbers? Instead of 7.5% per rank, it's 9% per rank. Isn't that cute? That's wonderful. How nice. Um, but there's a real reason as well, um, which is I am a personal, very big fan of having rank up choice. Now, sometimes this actually betrays the the like purpose of a champion, and it's bad. Um, so, for example, I think Q Max being correct on Zaya or even being good on Zaya is probably wrong. Um, I was a big fan when the designer who did those changes was first doing this because like Zaya didn't even come close to Q Max being like acceptable first or second. Um, over time, though, that change got overshot. And best Zaya was suddenly Q E Max Zaya full lethality, and like that's that's going too far, right? Um, because she becomes really uninteractable when she shoots a twelve hundred range skill shot, and then like becomes a target when you try to die for her. Um, but in general, and if you're not going to create unhealthy gameplay, I think it's actually a very good thing to have choice in skill rank ups. So Felios right now um, is basically about one percent win rate behind um, W Max compared to Emax second. Like QMAX first is still clearly correct and we're like never we're not close to that one. And that's fine. Q literally gives you flat base AD. Um now in a world where it's like, ah, it could give you percent bonus AD and like you, we could do some funky stuff and like probably get all the abilities to have some real consideration here. But considering the whole shtick with the Felios is he's meant to be the intellectually hardest to play AD carry, so deal with it. Um, and, like, players accept that and understand that, right? And that's great. Like, I'm glad that's his shot call. It's what he does. And I remember before I joined the design team, like, two years ago, I suggested something. I don't remember what it was anymore. But I suggested, like, hey, you know, we can make a Phyllis easier to play by, like, doing this thing. How do you feel about it? And they're like, no, he's meant to be, like, high skill cap, hard to play. And, like, we don't want to make him easier. I'm like, okay, sure, makes sense. Um, so that's the shot call, and that, that's where it is. So, okay, wonderful. Um, anyway, what this means with Aphelios is... Um, I am trying to make maxing W second competitive with maxing E second, uh, which means that theoretically you get into a game and you're like, they're running double frontline. I should absolutely fucking not run lethality. We should definitely run attack speed and get a Kraken Slayer because I have to kill frontline somehow this game. It's my job to do so. You see a different game and it's like, oh, they're running three assassins. There's no Ord on that team. Oh, it's definitely a lethality game. Like, that's a good thing, right? Right now, there really isn't a choice here. Um, and if I can get them competitive. And the thing is, like, if W gets too good here, um, like, I'm willing to, like, nudge E up a little bit more and, like, keep those there. Like, I feel like this is only so popular, so data is a little bit limited. It... it Especially on like rank up data because you're automatically splitting your your you know your player base uh, and usually not in exactly half so things that have really little uh, low amounts of sample but like I, I I would very much like if W and E second are competitive on a Felios and and using that as a kind of an almost too frequent tuning lever keeping them relatively close in power level so that you have that choice of am I a DPS frontline machine or am I bursting the backline machine? And I think that's really cool for him. And that's why I'm doing it. Yes, a very simple change, but literally this is the reason why I did it. It's fucking simple, but I thought about it, I promise. Let's move forward. Oh, actually, sorry, real quick. Um, here is the uh, data table here. So if you max W second and you have no other source of attack speed, which is obviously fraudulent, but you have up to 5% more attack speed uh, once you max it out uh, here at level 12. Um, of course, if you max it last, you have nothing for the first 12 levels of the game, which obviously makes it a very, very, very small buff if you're E max second. Um, but even in current tuning, one quarter of Felioses currently do QW max. So one quarter of Felios are going to get buffed by this. Um, and if WMAX, W second is not better than E second, um, people flocking over might actually lower the win rate very, very slightly. Um, but I still stand behind. I think this is a good change for Felios, And I really hope that the, the, the choices get balanced. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Um, Azir. Uh, I uh, went back and forth a lot on this one. So I picked up Azir um, to do like the individual design work on uh, with the idea being to... Um, 
lower his win rate in pro play. Uh, right now, I'm also doing a zero work in 13.5. Uh, in fact, there's... Um, a uh, Reddit thread right now of scraping the PVE of what my changes are on Azir. Um, I recommend you wait until tomorrow, um, aka what Thursday? Thursday, yeah, uh, to get the new PVE scrape because there's more stuff for him. Uh, but ultimately, um, I'll talk about that later, maybe over the weekend. Let's not worry about it. Um, the reason I brought it up is because um, version one of my Azir changes was way the hell too complex. This was something I picked up on the Monday and patch lock was in 48 hours. And this changes was like double this size. Like this is already five individual changes. I had like nine. And I like, I screwed up because I should never have a changes with nine things on it. If it's meant to be low scope, high, um, uh, like high reliability, um, don't break the freaking game. Uh, and so I, I, I tried too hard too quickly. Um, this changes ended up coming in pretty hot. I think I'm happy with it, but I I did not set myself up for success. But let's talk about the changes because I do think I screwed up on a on a procedural level. Although I am happy with the direction so far. And again, we'll talk about larger scope stuff, 30.5 maybe in this weekend. Um, so stay tuned for that. Uh, we'll talk about it then. But uh, he has 10 less base mana, but 15 more mana growth. We'll talk about the breakpoint later. Um, Arise, which is the ability you max second, has a one second longer uh, recharge time from levels one through seven. Eventually, um, it is the same at level 13. Um, from level, well, I guess second from level one because it has a bigger AP ratio. Shifting Sands damage is up. And Emperor's Divide damage is up, especially in the late game. Of course, it's the ability you max last. Let's talk about all these changes here. And then we'll talk about the reason why I, I looked for these and eventually cut down to this change list. Um, so here's Azir's base mana. Um, and then also his mana, if you consider that you're going to be out casting spells in lane for about four minutes. Um, so his base mana is down 20%, and it, it breaks even about level nine. Um, now, even though it's, you know, lower for one through eight, and then higher for 9 through 18, and in fact, you know, 20% higher at 18. Um, in general, this is a nerf. Even though you spend more of your time here, um, this matters a lot. Um, now, I used, um, and then we have uh, sort of the real world mana pool, which is, hey, by the way, his mana regen exists. And by the way, Azir has actually really high base mana regen. It's, it's 8 um, which is just, it's slightly high. Um, it's not extremely high, but it's, it's slightly, slightly high. Um, which, which carries a lot of his early game mana as well. So um, this so this is the one that actually you should look at. This is his like actual functional mana pool. And keep in mind that this guy, you know, always builds Ludens or Leandries or sometimes Crown or very occasionally Roa. He always builds a mana mythic first. Um, he pretty much always goes mana flow band. If he's going lethal tempo or conqueror, he's always going to run presence of mind. Um, and he's frequently running biscuits. So in the real world, his mana pool is actually much higher than even this looks like. But anyway... His mana pool is down about 12% at level 1, right? And if we're going to look at the like, first three levels, it's down about 10%. Um, you know, about here, right? Now, I actually looked at my Lucian changes from uh, the 13-1 micro patch and used that to help tabulate what we're on here. So, so Lucian actually, because I've, I've looked at this a lot and, and I'm pretty sure it's still true, and, and it seems to be with Lucian, um, love, even though mana as a stat, like mana, the ability to to use your mana pool well and and um, work around mana constraints um, is a pretty high skill concept. Um, like worst players, oom, and then screw up. Uh, and then they can't play the champion anymore. And, and better players are better at managing the mana pool. However, um, the early game is really, really high skill skewed. Either high MR solo queue or pro play straight up. Uh, which means that if I lower Azir's mana pool by 10% in the early game, he can cast basically 10% fewer spells. Because by the time he ooms, instead of spending 818 mana, he can only, you know, spend 900 mana, he can only spend 800 mana. Um, that is two fewer spells. Um, and obviously it loosens up over time, sure. Um, but like, even this is a little bit fraudulent because you still use the full level one region, the full level two region. And anyway, TLDR, um, using Lucian as the gut check, um, nerfing early game mana, buffing late game mana did in fact nerf him more in high elo than low elo. And in fact, I know of course Nami was nerfed as well, but Lucian is an overall lower pro presence champion now than he was in 13.1. Um, people are hopping off a little bit. Uh, so, like, this does have an effect. This is a pro-skewed nerf, a high-elo-skewed nerf. Um, 
And then again, this does not end up being a win rate buff, but it's going to mean more for silver, gold, bronze Azirs than it will for challenger Azirs to a certain degree. We then have the W recharge, where again, the early inning phase has significantly fewer soldiers. It's going to be up less. By the way, the, the recharge is still the same as soldier duration. You can never be without soldiers unless you run out of range or throw it under a turret so it dies twice as fast. You always have soldiers available. And yeah, by level 13, it's the same. But for the first level of the game, Azir has fewer soldiers. He has less mana. This is going to nerf his early game, but it's going to do something to pull out some pro skew. Uh, now, of course, next up is just simple E damage. Of course, this is pushing a zero to get something else in the late game. But it's like, yeah, you know, Eing in for damage is a more useful tool. Um, now, a zero's kit is in a... Okay, we'll talk about it in a second. Sorry. Um, so, okay, E damage is up 5 to 28%. Pretty substantial stuff here. Certainly, E's ballistic missile is going to be stronger. And then, of course, we have the R damage up here as well. Up pretty substantially. Bigger AP ratio, bigger base damage. Pretty substantial stuff here. Uh, quite a big nuke. So... Um, I'm basically assuming that the E and R buff are going to be low MMR skewed buffs. That if you're not an extremely skilled Azir player, if you're not good at landing the auto attacks, keeping the uptime going, that, well, at least you could just have mage outputs and do something. Don't worry, your ultimate has 125 more base damage, so if you're having a really horrible game, it's okay. Just send out Emperor's Divide, you can at least do something. Um, Azir has, um, among the sharpest... Um, mastery curves in League of Legends. He is very hard to play. He is um, really, really, really mastery skewed. Um, and yeah, this is, this is kind of what's going on. And I'm not expecting to like remove Azir's like skill tests, but um, I'm, I'm confident that this nerf is high elo skewed. This nerf is high elo skewed. And I believe that these buffs are going to be low elo skewed. Um, so there is a decent chance that via these changes, Azir lowers in pro presence and gains win rate in sub gold, which is awesome because this guy is like 45% in sub gold, which is really, really bad. And he's like a top two champion in pro play. I think it's probably the number one mid laner right now. And it's like, this is an extreme, extreme gulf in power. And if all that happens is we is we, is we we shrink the, the deficit a little bit, that's fine, right? A at least making progress is a good thing. And it's like, yeah, moving numbers around to make that happen, trying to keep the identity of the champion intact. And again, I'll talk about longer term Azir stuff when it's time for that. But for now, it's this patch rundown. And um, yes, he's becoming more of a burst mage, but he is nowhere close to being just a burst mage. He still has extremely high auto attack DPS, but making him less of a lane bully and more of a no, I am the late game king. I am the emperor of late game. That's that's like a healthier spot for him uh, to keep him in pro play solo queue balance. Let's go to the next one. Shogath is getting pretty simple buffs here. Um, hasn't been doing the best in solo queue. Pretty simple buffs. So 0.3 armor growth, uh, 10 mana cost off the queue, 0 to 20 damage onto the queue, and then a simple mana cost uh, lower on Feral Scream of 0 to 20 here as well. Very simple stuff. Very, very, very chill. Um, here's armor growth. It ends up being about 2% uh, more durability. Uh, late gaming is physical damage. Uh, here's the queue damage. You meant to max queue last. E the W is the correct skill order. So um, here's that. Here's the W cost. Keep in mind that this is in fact, uh, is in fact yep, a little bit more damage. The W cost is, of course, uh, though it's red, this is a buff. It is 5 to 20 less mana cost. Pretty simple stuff here for Cho'Gath. I like the changes. Positive for him. He's going to do a bit better. Good job. Good stuff there. Elise is getting 10 to 30 damage removed off of Q and losing some early spider form spiderling damage. Minus 0, minus 1, same, and then uh, plus 1. So these, of course, both end up being um, obvious nurse to the champion. We can talk about the numbers right here. Um, if you count the percent health damage here as well, it's not a substantial nerf. Keep in mind that this does not affect neurotox or anything else. It is just simply venomous bite. It's simply melee Q. So keep in mind that, you know, one of her... I mean, I'm going to say seven because spider form has spiderlings and thus itself deals damage. Um, I guess it's functionally two of her seven abilities got nerfed, right? Spiderlings and spider form and then um, her melee Q. So it is, of course, less damage. It's, of course, going to be less execute champion. He's going to lose a little bit of early game. Um, jungle clear, just 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 a tad. Um, not a, a huge difference, but uh, definitely going to matter. He's going to be less of an assassin. And Elise has become like, I think she's like the number three champion pro play right now behind Ash and Maokai last I checked. Um, she's really, really, really big. Um, Maokai's, of course, getting nerfed. Ash, um, spoilers, we're going to nerf in 13.5. Um, so uh, anyway, Elise, I mean, certainly queen of the jungle. And and yeah, I mean, also a, a massive, 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 massive ban rate problem in pro play. Uh, part of the reason, by the way, we haven't gone for um, Ash just yet is um, 
Ash was not yet an ultra top end pro pick at the beginning. Um, and she was not a big ban rate threat or win rate threat anywhere. So there was nothing to indicate that she was a problem in solo queue. Like she was popular, but pop doesn't mean you have to nerf a champion. Oh no, people are playing Ash. We're not allowed to do this. Like she has global map reveal and a stun. Like her kid is clearly very supportive. Um, everything but Q literally applies crowd control of some kind. Like she has a supportive kit and if she's popular, okay, great. Um, but it's until she crushes pro pick ban and until her solo queue ban rate goes up because people don't want to play against her then there's not, like, any to do it. But, of course, now pro play data indicates that, yep, Ash is the current queen um, of pro play. So, again, you know, pick that up at some point. But, yeah, Elise was picked up because of um, incredibly, incredibly high um, high MMR uh, ban rate stuff. So, off she goes. And, yeah, a pretty, pretty reasonably sized nerf. And, and again, um, the, the target is early game. I'm not that sure who did this, but I think it, it, these are good changes. Um, nerfing Azir's early game, you know, slightly buffing late game, technically. Um, but... Uh, sorry, nerfing Elise is early game because, um, right, just gank spam is, is how early game works in pro play and, and high elo. And, uh, yeah, I don't think you ever get uh, Elise's kit to the point where she's not an early game focused champion. But if you can move the curve a little bit, it's probably a good thing. Anyway, move on to the next one. So Jarvan, I think, had really good change in the previous patch where he got an AD ratio on his W. He got a cooldown drop, I think, from 10 to 8. Um, and this is what kind of walks it back a little bit because Jarvan was um, pretty much the biggest winner of 13.3. Um, certainly doing incredibly, incredibly well. So walks back the cooldown uh, buff a little bit uh, and then walks back the shield buff a very little bit as well. Jarvan should still end up very strong. There's certainly, um, this is certainly power positive compared to 13.2. This is definitely um, really, really strong stuff for him. But here is his new shield value after the nerfs. Um, not, you know, substantially down, but, you know, down a little bit. Uh, here is, um, counting for the cooldown nerf as well. This is shielding per minute, um, which is just kind of a way to filter in the, the cooldown change as well. And so, you know, in the case that like, hey, cooldown, you know, shields per minute is functionally how much he's going to have over the course of a fight. Not, of course, a full minute long, but just like the ability to recast it, stay live in a fight. Like that's going to be there. Um, he's building Gordrick, which has cooldown on it. Cooldown boots are good for him, has cooldown on it. You know, Black Cleaver is really common to him that has cooldown on it. So, um, you know, he's going to get multiple W's off in a fight. So lowering the base cooldown, or rather nerfing the base cooldown, is going to lower his ability to get a second W or a third W. And, you know, this this does matter. So um, pretty solid nerf here. I think good stuff for Jarvan. And he's still going to be a quite strong champion. I'm going to go on next to Jax, who is just doing a bit too well. Um, I think some of this is ban rate, some of this is win rate. Um, he's certainly a, a fairly big pro champion as well. Uh, but uh, pretty simple stuff here. 20 base health. This is kind of rounding the, the health growth. Uh, technically, he still ends with um, three less health level 18. This is more just rounding, I'm pretty sure. And I mean, it very, very slightly, very slightly softens the nerf, but uh, minor nerf here to Jax. Um, so the bigger stuff is the fact that uh, there was 20 less damage on um, early R um, than 10 less damage than the same value on R. Um, this is just simply uh, AP Jax. Uh, now the dodges, uh, it doesn't have to be for AP Jax necessarily, but basically um, now everything um, is multiplied by dodging attacks. I think the ability should work this way in the first place, where just the entire thing now deals um, double damage. But um, yeah, so the max damage instead of, um, you know, right, the AP ratio, oh, by the way, AP ratio did get nerfed, by the way, from 1 to 0.7, but on full dot, it's 1 to 1.4, so obviously quite a bit better. Um, Max health damage, by the way, also now filtered in. 4% max health becomes 8% max health. So um, certainly some some meaningful changes here. Uh, but if you're going like, oh, I'm going to play AP Jax and snap cast the ability, well, the AP ratio is lower on this one. So snap cast AP Jax, everything comes out instantly. Um, going to be less strong, but if you're going to let the dodges come in, then cool, strong ability. Pretty easy, chill stuff there. Uh, next up, though, is also the uh, bonus armor and then functionally MR. Um, for champions getting hit uh, is going down here as well. This has always been 60% of this number, so nothing too exciting we have to look at. Or um, So we can just talk about that a little bit later. But uh, functionally, minus 10, minus 5, minus 0. Uh, no AD ratio change. And again, this is just 60%. So uh, we can talk about Jax's health before and after. Um, not a substantial nerf. Again, not a very big deal. Um, here is his average damage per auto during his ulti, a.k.a. it hits every other auto attack. Um, so it's, it's down... His auto attack damage is down level 6 through 15, which is a solid portion of the mid game. Definitely is going to matter here a little bit. Um, and then here is how much armor he has during his ulti. Of course, pre-6, it's just his base armor, but here's how much armor he has. Um, accounting for expected bonus AD here as well. Um, it's, it's you know, 10-ish, right? And then 5 and then 0 less armor, which is a, a 5 to like 2% less physical damage durability and then here's the mr table uh relatively similar stuff here as well it's less harsh because of course the ability does less for him so minor stuff there malphite is getting some pretty simple buffs uh lower cooldown on w a higher armor ratio on both halves of w here as well uh here is a w cooldown down two seconds you max it last um 
You probably still will, arguably, maybe you switch that out, but it doesn't really matter either way. Uh, lower cooldown, again, this is a buff by two seconds. Uh, here is the uh, amount of bonus auto attack damage coming through on his W, roughly. Here is the amount of cone damage coming through on the W, roughly. Um, it's, it's a decent uh, approximation of how much is coming out here, uh, but this is, you know, directionally accurate. It's, you know, pretty essentially increased damage, so going to feel pretty good about him being more of an auto attacker. We move on next to Maokai, um, who is certainly a very, very strong and pretty overbearing champion uh, in both pro play and solo queue. Uh, I had my fun playing some AP Maokai earlier on in the season, but he's definitely too good. So the first thing I talk about is actually Sapling Toss. Um, Sapling Toss cooldown increased by four seconds. So the thing is, Sapling Toss actually has a pretty aggressive mana cost. It's 55 to 95 based on rank. Um, very few skills go up 10 mana per rank, and 95 is relatively high for a skill, right? Because ultimates are 100. Um, now the problem is, uh, jungle items give you mana regen in the jungle or in the river, um, which means that functionally anytime you are remotely setting up for objectives, AP Maokai, or jungle Maokai in general, just doesn't have a mana cost on anything. He just gets to spam saplings forever. And so you can't balance sapling toss spam around the mana cost, because the class he's most played in just functionally breaks that as a lever. So it has to be cooldown if you want to nerf sapling spam at all. Um, and so the primary nerf on this ability is in fact the cooldown. Um, and this is primarily a nerf for sapling spam jungle Maokai, where um, cooldown is the only constraint this ability has and nothing else really has one. Um, and I tried to not nerf it uh, the rest of the way as much as I could. Now, um, ultimately... Still want to nerf magic damage a little bit here on the sapling, so minus 5 damage to sapling. Keep in mind, this damage doubles when it's in brush. Um, the AP ratio going down from 0.35 um, to 0.25. Um, there is a world where Bramble Smash is about to have a higher AP ratio itself. Um, for now, that's not in, uh, because I didn't want to confuse the change list and accidentally buff a champion who needs a nerf directly, so I added very little compensation here. Uh, but ultimately, what I said um, up here about... Um, um, AP tree being a reasonable build, like theoretically, but glass cannons need to actually be threatened is, is really core to this. I think if AP Maokai has his AP ratio on Q and W, I think you can play AP Maokai and he can feel like a reasonable as an AP bruiser, right? As, as the magic tree, he builds ability power and he's a bruiser mage. I think it is possible to support bruiser AP Maokai as a real champion if there are real bruiser items, but really he just builds demonic and he's allowed to build Leandries as a melee champion with no disengage tools because he just plays at 2000 range. Um... So ultimately, he has to have Sapling Toss be nerfed because the only thing that his kit's really doing and the current tuning of Demonic Embrace because there aren't any other AP Bruiser items. Um, you can only even do so much with the ability power ratio. So base damage is down, ability power ratio is down. This ends up being a really, really meager AP ratio. It takes a lot. Of, it, this takes, um, I think, 600 AP to double the damage of the ability. It's, it's really, really gnarly weak. But again, there's only so many levers here for this ability. So cooldown is going to do a lot of heavy lifting. Um... The slow, I honestly probably should have removed this entirely. Um, I'm a really big fan of, of abilities having different scalers on them. But I think in terms of abilities being readable, I think they should probably be a bit distinct. Um, so like, for example, Kale Q, uh, the damage scales off both bonus AD and ability power, which makes it really hard to know if AD or AP is the better scaler on that ability. Now, spoilers, AD Kale is bad right now. You have to play AP on her, and that's fine. Um, but... You know, it's kind of a bait that she has AD ratios when the build isn't actually supported. Um, that's a different discussion for another time, but I want to point that out. But here you look at the tooltip and you're like, here's Maokai. All right, my damage scales off my bonus health and my ability power. My slow scales off my bonus health and my ability power. Which one am I supposed to build? And it's like, if the E damage only scales off AP and the E slow only scales off health, it's like, oh, I get it. Tank Maokai is more CC, AP Maokai is more damage. Cool, great, yay, hooray. That, that makes sense, I get it. I know what this champion's about. Um, so, you know, ultimately, I mean, what I did is I I, I buffed the uh, bonus health ratio uh, on the slow. It's very by a very, very small amount, don't get me wrong, but I did buff it. Uh, and then I just, like, crushed the AP ratio here because, hey, um, look, Sapling E is still going to deal a lot of damage. You build Demonic Embrace, you build AP, and you build Leandries, you build all those things. Um, that's still going to happen. You're still going to have that damage. But you know what? You're not going to also have the crowd control. Okay? that That's going to be in the in the realm of Tank Maokai. And keep in mind that Tank Maokai still gets nerfed by 5, aka 10 damage on Sapling Toss. Um, and he still gets nerfed by 4 seconds on Sapling Toss. So, um, in, in a hope to make good somewhat on Tank Maokai, who, to be fair, is strong, but not a ban rate problem, he gets a little something back. Um, so let's talk about the numbers overall, which is that um, the Maokai Q damage is going from 2 to 3% max health to 2 to 4% max health damage. Okay, so here is Maokai Q damage. Um, if you don't build AP and if you do build AP, 
Um, as you can see, building a bunch of ability power barely raises the damage of the ability. There is no reason for AP for AP Maokai to exist on a, as a melee champion because you really aren't even scaling this damage in any meaningful way. Um, so at some point, if I want to go and make a Bruiser AP Maokai a thing, one of the places I would look at. But anyway, we move on from this. Um, the E damage on a tank build is indeed down. Um, this is the ability that you're going to max second in a lot of cases. Maybe you're going to max it last in, in some other cases. But um, hey, it's down 8% in the early game. We don't have any scaling. But as you get more and more bonus health onto the kit, uh, it does have a decent damage scaling. And hey, here it is. It's decent damage. And it's not it's not so heavily nerfed, right? It's down 2%. You look at the AP build, though, and it's down quite a lot more. AP Maokai E does about 10% less damage. Keep mine is still going to apply Demonic Embrace in Leandri's and maybe Red Jungle Pet at full value. But at least the underlying damage is now down 10%, uh, which is pretty meaningful and, and a pretty heavy hit here to that ability. Keep in mind, again, the cooldown is also 4 seconds longer, so this should do quite a lot to make AP Tree less absurd. Uh, here is the slow value before and after, so again, buffed it very, very slightly. It's not a very large amount, but, um, you know, the absolute slow value is up about 1% to 2% for Tank Maokai. But the absolute slow value is actually down now for AP Maokai. It turns out that old AP Maokai, in fact, had more slow than old Tank Maokai, which to me kind of betrays those builds being different at all. So now it's just definitely um, Tank Maokai goes up to 60% slow. If Maokai does not at all. And again, there's a world where um, this should be ripped out entirely. Keep in mind, I am actually assuming that he's building some amount of bonus health because he's building things like Demonic Embrace. Um, uh, Shadow Flame and um, Horizon Focus can, can kind of fit here as well on the build. So uh, I am still doing some amount of bonus health scaling on visibility in this, like, data table. Uh, but again substantially nerfed for the AP build uh, and and we'll see where it goes but I think it's a pretty good set of changes Oriana gets 3 armor and 10 mana cost of W pretty simple changes but uh, that's just fine um, 2 to 1.5% more physical durability of course keep in mind her armor is higher with E sort of on her own head so uh, in some of these cases it's not going to be quite as strong as it might look um, W cost though down by 10 pretty simple stuff here just very simple Oriana buffs nothing too you know spectacular to look at here but um, champ is not really in pro play very much can still use a lift and solo queue, so just follow up off the Oriana changes from 13.2 slash 13.1b, same patch. Riven gets a really cool change here. Um, pretty early game focused. Uh, now this um, total AD bonus damage is uh, simply going to scale um, uh, just every single character level instead of every breakpoint. Um, in fact, oh, I just realized I did this kind of wrong. Um, this is actually at 1, 6, 9, 12, 15, 18. So I need to update my uh, thing real quick, but let, let's do that. Let's go over here. Uh, let's scroll down to Riven, and that's actually, there we go, uh, 39, 39, 39, no wait, this is 42, wait, I'm trolling, 42, 42, 48, 48, 48, 54, 54, 54, and 60, there we go, there's a new data table, alright, we solved it, so level 1, level 18 is the same, but every other place from there it is better and is especially better in the early game so riven's auto attacks in trades especially in a landing phase are going to be much much stronger this is a pretty meaningful buff the amount of damage her passive provides after every single spell cast if she auto attacks pretty meaningful stuff here additionally um it now deals some damage to turrets it deals half um of its damage to turrets so if she wants to go and stay inside lane and split push and go crush a turret a bit more damage out of structures pretty cool stuff here additionally um, visible to herself, she can see her own passive stacks. I know this has been a pretty long requested feature. Um, the pushback for the longest time has been that um, it is screen clutter to opponents because nothing about your interaction with Riven change whether or not she has passive stacks. You compare that to like Corky Rockets or Gangplank Barrels or um, things like that where you actually really, really want to know if this resource is available or not to the champion. Um, it doesn't matter for Riven. Like, it's not that big of an increase in how much damage she's dealing, um, and it doesn't actually change any of the functional play. Um, but making it self-only allows Rivens to have the clarity on what they have passive-wise, which is cool, without the screen clutter, which I really will defend as um, something that, that is um, important to always keep front of mind. I think screen clutter is um, an incredibly slippery slope, and one that I think Riot's done a pretty good job of not keeping, um, uh, of keeping at bay, I should say. So Samira is a change that um, I had pushed for on the uh, last week, uh, almost weeks ago actually, a week from last Thursday meeting, um, where, uh, yeah, pretty sure that's the timing. Anyway, um, where, hey, Samira has an increasing, increasing, increasing ban rate. She's been high winner for a very, very long time. Um, she has been functionally 
um, one of the like three best bands in League of Legends for the last two months where she is popular and high win rate, uh, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, but she just kind of has been a very good ban. And the banner is finally crept enough to where it's like, okay, she's been high win rate for a very, very long time. She's like stale in that regard. Um, and honestly, she is pretty frustrated to fight against because of how snowball she is. So the nerfs are really just a snowball factor. Um, and I'm not trying to get Samira below 50% win rate. Um, I actually, uh, the first version of these changes were actually meant to be um, late game base stat nerfs akin to a Mumu because, right, she's not in pro play. Her her actual um, generic power curve, she tends to be a bit of a scaling pick based on public data um, because, yes, of course, she can snowball lane, but, like, she actually becomes a team fight monster. So it's like, oh, well, we can just, like, nerf her late game scaling, nerf her solo queue win rate stuff. And the, and the pushback was, like, this is not going to make her feel less frustrating. People are still going to ban her. She's going to have a lower win rate. And you're not going to actually approach the problem, which was actually good feedback. And so I picked a different set of changes. So these changes are instead to lower her early game snowballing. Um, her move speed via her passive is now going to scale um, on its own at levels 1, 6, 11, 16. Just going to scale on character level. It doesn't actually matter if you rank the ult or not, although of course you should. Um, but basically, she's going to run you down way less hard in the early game, where now if she kills your first champion, she won't guarantee run a second one. Now keep in mind, her E resets and kill and assist, so she's still getting another dash. She's probably still going to stay in range of you, but at least she's not going to run absurdly faster than you before level 6. Um, additionally, just an overall snowballiness, an overall feeling, um, you know, sort of less bad about how, how strong a champion can be. Um, less lifesteal on the ulti. All right, so what's going on here? Uh, well, here is Samira's ref move speed. Uh, these breakpoints, by the way, here at 5 and 9 are assuming she buys boots 1 and then buys boots 2. Uh, but here is her move speed with a full stacked passive. Um, and it's 12% less move speed. Um, 1 through 5, then 7% less move speed, then 2% less move speed, then 2% more move speed. So technically, she is faster at level 16 plus. Um, that's obviously, this is of course a nerf overall the champion. Uh, but really, her running you, less, running you down less in the landing phase is meant to be experientially very different, and that should be pretty valuable. Of course, having um, one, what, sixth? Hang on, no, one quarter. I think it's one quarter less healing. Um, cause yeah, she goes from, from, yeah, she goes to three sixths from four sixths. So yeah, one quarter less healing to the ultimate. I'm um, certainly going to be pretty relevant there as well. So the amount of time she drains things your entire team, the amount of time she runs you down to the early game, um, all those are going to be felt a little bit. So, um, hopefully brings down Samira a lot. Again, I'm not trying to bring her below 50% win rate. I would like her to still be a totally viable champion. She's a really, really cool champion. She's popular for a reason because she's freaking awesome. Um, but if people are less frustrated that she's banned less and Samira players are allowed to play Samira again. Um, so it's the kind of thing where everyone wins. If Samira is nerfed to be less frustrating, but still 50% win rate, everyone wins. So that's the hope here. That's what I'm targeting. We'll hopefully get there. Um, Senna is getting um, what are actually some pretty spicy changes, um, in, in my opinion. So people, not in support. I think support players are building Lethality and they're building Umbral Glaive and they're doing fine stuff. But people who are playing Senna as a core AD carry, um, they just freaking love the Kraken Slayers, man. They they just love building Kraken Slayer, even though the build is... is not very performant on her. Uh, increasing her base attack ratio uh, is going to do a lot to make Kraken Slayer way less bad. Um, her level 1 attack speed is unchanged. It's still 0.625. Uh, but the way the math works out, this functionally really, really, really raises the value of getting further attack speed. This is Legend Alacrity. This is Kraken Slayer. This is Zerker Greaves. All that kind of stuff is going to feel a lot better on this champion. Um, and then also some pretty simple damage buffs. Um, 0 to 50... Uh, and a 0.15 bonus AD ratio increase in R. Keep in mind that Senna's souls are bonus AD. So this is this bonus AD scaling is functionally a flat damage increase on the R here as well. Um, pretty essential there. And then 20 seconds off the cooldown is going to be felt quite a bit. This has a very, very long cooldown. 160 is very long. Keep in mind it is a global. So uh, it's reasonable to have a long cooldown. You don't want this. This thing should not have 6 second cooldown until, you know, late in the game. Pretty, you know, smart stuff there. But let's talk about what's going on. So here are her attacks per second. If you do not get any source of attack speed, you go Swifty Boots, you go Legend Bloodline, you go Fleet Footwork, you get um, the cooldown stat shard, you, you know, build full lethality, you don't build any attack speed. Here is your attack speed before and after if you don't have like a Jarvan on your team or anything else like that going on. Um, it is eventually, if you can get really late in the game, like 7% more attack speed. 
if you're going to build Kraken Slayer and run stat shards and Legend Blood or Legend um, Alacrity and things like this, you're gonna get 90 percent bonus attack speed through items overall in the game, which is just like a reasonable stand-in for like a decent amount of AS you're gonna buy in the champion. It is a solid up to 14 percent more auto attacks. This is a really big deal. Keep in mind that when um, I buffed Zaya in the 13 point, I think it was 13 point one straight up. It was 13 point one, but the first patch I ever had a hand in, um, Zaya got. Um, straight up, just 5.8% more attack speed at all points in time, and it was 2.5% win rate. Um, this is not quite that, but if you're playing Kraken Slayer, it is this. So, like, this to me is, like, this is, like, a 3 to 4% win rate bump to Kraken Slayer Senna. I, I, I'm pretty sure it's a 3 to 4% win rate bump to Kraken Slayer Senna. Um, this is, like, a 1.5% win rate bump to, like, Lethality Senna. Um... And to be fair, this actually probably puts those builds pretty close in power level. Um, and keep in mind also, there's here's here's Senna R damage up by four to ten percent. Here's the cooldown down about twelve to fifteen percent. Um, these are really really large Senna buffs. Senna is going to be very good next patch. Uh, there's a good chance I'm just going to spam support next patch and gain some free low playing Senna because this champ I think is looking real good. Uh, here is follow up to Thresh. Um, this is functionally. Uh, following up on the pared down list from 13.3. So I shipped kind of what I wanted in 13.3, which is to try to make Q Max better and W Max worse. Um, I didn't go hard enough. It was another thing where I tried to take a bigger change list. I got it cut down, probably correctly so. And it's okay, let's follow up and, and do the rest of the work here. Um, because to be fair, buff, if, if in one patch I'm a death sentence by 0 to 40 damage and like add 0.3 to the ability power ratio and add 0.35 to the ability power ratio and like do a whole bunch of stuff, like that is a really, really, really large patch. So it going piecemeal, I think is reasonable. Um, but I think. So I actually looked and I actually I, I spot checked this because Thresh got played in the LCS last weekend. Um, Corey today's skill order on Thresh was two points Q, two points E, and then max W. Um, w max is the correct way to play Thresh right now, but is the least interesting way to play Thresh. But it turns out getting 100 bonus shield on both yourself and your target, getting six seconds off the cooldown is just the best you could rank up on this champion. And so you just have to play W max Thresh. Um, I think Thresh is way cooler if it's Q Max and or E Max, but in either order, you do the damage abilities on Thresh. Thresh is a relatively squishy champion. He is a playmaker. I think he is a damage champion. He's a hook champion. He's an aggressive champion. And to me, if the best way to play Thresh is, oh no, you leave Q as a one point wonder with a freaking 19 second cooldown, you should max hook on the hook champion last. Like that, to me, is, is not okay. And so I'm trying really hard to make Q Max good. So not only does Q Max get another 20 damage on rank up, um, the AP ratio, keep in mind that's that's 0.1 damage per soul, meaning any cooldown incentive, such as this one, um, is an incentive to rank the ability because the base damage is now functionally higher. Um, but also, I'm increasing, well, real increasing, whatever, the cooldown incentive. Um, the cooldown incentive was actually not my idea. This was actually a great suggestion from someone else on the team. Um, because it's even more interesting. It's like, hey, what if you just like actually make him the sickest freaking hook champion? If you land the hook, it resets. So I, I played as a Thresh earlier this week. Um, and um, with like Mythic plus Stat Shard plus cooldown boots plus like component, like Kindle Gem, if you land Q, it the, the cooldown is back when you're done hooking someone. Like if they don't have tenacity and the Q just like ends at the full one half second duration, it's back and you're ready to go again. Because this 9 second cooldown is really a 6 second cooldown if it lands. Um, and it has a half second cast time. Which to be fair, it doesn't put it on cooldown during, during the cast time. But it has to fly out and that's a stick for 1 and a half seconds. And that just sort of turns out that's long enough with ability haste that like this thing is just up. And you can hook and the hook breaks. And, and you get half second to try. And then you gotta go side and I'm coming back for you. Um, it felt real good. I'm, I mean, Q, uh, there's a real chance that QMAX Thresh is just way overpowered. But keep in mind, it has, like, 3% win rate to gain. It was going to catch up with W Max Thresh. So, like, you, we can swing pretty hard here, and it's kind of going to be okay. Um, there was a good chance that Thresh is going to be too good next patch. And, well, therefore, that has to happen. But, like, if Thresh the pro champion... Yo, Doc, come on. Come on. Be real. What would you rather see in pro play? Ash and Vera support? Or Thresh? Be real with me. Come on. Let's let's be real. Like, Thresh should, like... I, I mean, I talked earlier in this in this video about, like, designers, like, making making winners. Thresh should be a permanent winner in pro play. Like, I, in my opinion, Thresh should literally never leave pro play. Um, just, like, 
I don't, I'm not saying I'm not saying 100 pick ban, right? But like, if Thresh is under 10 percent pro presence, the game is the game. The esport is worse for it. Like Thresh should just like have a like there should be alarm bells that is like Thresh is not 10 percent present last patch. You must buff him. Like just that's my opinion. This this champ is so freaking cool. This is such a well designed, such an awesome champion. He is the most skill expressive like support by a mile. I wish we could have another Thresh. Like I wish someone would would find another kit as cool as this. Um, I think Rakan is like one of the closer ones. I think Rakan is also super sick, by the way. Like these playmaking, like agility, squishy melees is like such a cool class um, that like I'm about it. So, so anyway, yeah, pretty big off here. Uh, we'll go to the rest of it. Uh, Dark Passage, um, right? Like even though Q Max, E Max, Thresh is clearly getting strictly buffed. Um, Dark Passage because a one second cooldown. Um, buff for you're just chilling with rank one of W. It's a second shorter on the cooldown. This doesn't have to happen, but I, I wanted to do it. Um, w rank up, by the way, uh, right? Instead of being one and a half seconds, now only one second. Instead of getting 25 shields, 20 shields. So certainly um, W max is weaker by 20 shield. It's weaker by a one second cooldown. And I'm just trying to promise you that you can max Q and E is going to be cool. Um, e is getting a 20 damage rank up. Um, and again, the 0.1 AP ratio to make it a little bit better here. We're nowhere close to AP Thresh being any good, but um, anyway, look, let's look at this. Here is um, Q max damage uh, before and after. It's 20 flat damage, and again, the AP ratio, uh, which works with souls. Here's the before and after, 18% off the cooldown. To keep in mind that if this is um, 8 and 6, uh, it's 25% off the cooldown. It's pretty it's pretty nice stuff. And of course, you're going to have ability haste in, in your kit um, from your mythic and whatnot as well. So it's going to be even, even nicer over time. Um, if you're going to go ahead and max uh, W last, uh, the cooldown is better from levels 1 through 14. Again, a strict buff to the champion. Um, the shield is going to be the same until level 14, and then, you know, there it is. It's going to actually be weaker here. Uh, here is, if you're maxing E second, here is the damage on E. The AP ratio gives you a little bit of damage early on, but as you start ranking it from level 8 onwards, you get a solid 20 extra damage, and it gets to feel a little bit better as a skill. So, uh, yeah, substantial damage increase to Q, E, W, Thresh. Um, even gets a lower lantern cooldown on QEW Thresh. I mean, really, really big buffs to to that skill order. But again, QEW is literally his worst skill order. Um, if I wasn't clear about that one earlier, uh, QEW is his worst skill order, and I want it to be his best skill order, or at least EQW being his best skill order. Like, either one of those is fine with me. Um, but you know, if Q if if Q is not max for a second, like that's just that's just uh, to, to me like really bad for the champion. Next, a pretty um, simple set of changes to Udyr. Health growth is down. Base armor is down. A little bit less on-hit damage on the Q via the bonus AD ratio. And a little bit less base slow on the R. I'm actually a really big fan of the slow being worse on the R. Um, that's one of the more frustrating parts of the kit. So pretty simple changes, but we can talk about that. Um, it's worth noting that Q max and R max Udyr are now pretty much the same win rate. So uh, good job to... It hasn't ever been me. I haven't touched an Udyr. Uh, I haven't touched Udyr as a designer. But um, good to get those builds at least into relative sort of similarity for power level wise that's good stuff but here is his health before and after down four percent uh counting for his armor as well it's down two to six percent in terms of physical durability um here is the amount of on hit damage you get from the q uh, down about eight ten percent here's the amount of slow from the r and it's down of course a flat five percent slow which in terms of the amount of boost you're reducing is you know eighty percent less reduction uh than before Vagar gets 100 range on his Q and 50 range on his W. Pretty cool stuff there. Letting him play from farther a range a little bit safer. So I think this is a really, really cool change. I think this is smart stuff by the designer. Um, and I think version 1 was accepted. And we're like, yeah, this looks cool. Go for it. Um, yeah, I think it was a really cool change. Go, good for Vagar. Um, Viego. Making his crit builds better. Um, ultimately, I think Viego is a healthier champion when he has to build more glass cannon, considering that he heals on takedown and he has these untargetability resets and whatnot. Um, anytime that kind of kit is tanky, it gets really unhealthy really, really fast. Um, so if the best way to play Viego is be squishy and actually be killable if you are caught, that is generally going to be healthier for the game overall. Um, so the passive damage on the Q auto is now able to critically... Uh, strike and the bonus AD ratio on the R is now a little bit higher, making sure you have to actually build damage items to have good damage in the R. And of course, the base damage is still there, but overall, Viego is a pretty low win rate. And so, buffing him in terms of no, go build him squishy, no, really go build him squishy, I think is a good thing for the champion, a good thing for the game. Um, R damage right here, 8 to 14% more damage on the R with a pretty typical bonus AD build. Cool stuff. Demonic Embrace is now capped at 40 damage per second against monsters. Um, this is not a huge deal. Uh, the cap is somewhere around, like, I think 4,000 health-ish. Um, it's like, like 3,500 or something for melee and um, 
like over 4,000 for range. Functionally, this doesn't change. It obviously can't change your first few clears because you don't have the Monica Brace yet until around level 9-ish when you kind of finish your first item. Um, but even then, it's like barely going to affect Big Gromp. It's not going to affect Big Krug. It's barely going to affect Red and Blue. It will affect the speed at which you kill um, Rift Herald and um, Baron and Dragon. Like that's going to be relevant, but... Um, in a lot of those cases, you're going to fight them with the team anyway. Uh, certainly in, in the case of Rift Child and Drake, you can solo them a little bit, but um, I don't think it's going to actually be a very, very big deal. It's not going to affect most jungle monsters. Again, it only affects um, like about three of the jungle monsters. It, it'll do something, but it's not a big deal here. Door Shield, two less health per five. Um, yeah, I mean, this is going to hurt um, any of these sort of anti-poke matchups. This does a lot for Akali Silas versus ranged in pro play. This does a lot for melee versus ranged in top lane, um, kind of everywhere. Uh, yeah, pretty big nerf. Uh, I think this makes Doran's Shield not viable in any bot laners. There is the occasional time you'd think about it on someone like Neela or something, or if it's a really, really bad lane uh, and you're against, you know, just double poke, but I think item is kind of dead there. Um, it's probably still optimal in a lot of melee range situations, but you're now more poke outable in those situations. All right. Um, support item adjustments. Base health regen is up by 25% on Relic Shield, Targon's Buckler, Shoulder Guards, and Spalders. Um, so um, this kind of is this is not me doing it. This is a different designer. Um, but this is kind of going along with what uh, I had done with Alistair Passive and um, Brom W and um, uh, Nautilus W. Those are the three. Yeah, Alistair Passive, Nautilus, Brom. Where it's like, hey, you can kind of withstand poke a little bit more. You got to play the lane a little bit more. And it's like, well, just here, just the whole class gets more health regen. Okay, great. Um, this, I think, is actually really, really clever. I think this is actually very smart. The, the um, charge generation is um, slowed down a little bit. So we actually have data on uh, support item completion times, and not only is Spell Thieves and Co. on average a bit faster, but like the the like top five percentile is absurdly faster because you're you're really kind of hard capped in how fast you can get stacks with Relic Shield. Even if you get cannons every time they're up, and even roam the mid to get cannons, like there's still only so much you can do with that item. Whereas Spell Thieves has a really really large gap between the ultra best case and the average case. Um, and so increase the charge generation time, most just nerfs the best case and doesn't really affect the um, lower case nearly as much. Um, the region going down a little bit here as well just makes you a lot less spammy on these champions. I think also a pretty reasonable set of changes, but this definitely does um, quite a bit. It's kind of interesting that um, the 80s part items are not getting nerfed nearly as hard um, as, as the AP ones. Um, now, Ash is really the only, I would say, abusive um, AD support here. Um, I think, like, yeah, we see a little bit of Jin, a little bit of Caitlyn, a little bit of Varys, things like that, but, like, a little bit of Callista. But those are kind of, like, around as opposed to Ash being, like, just ultra-dominant in pro play um, and actually winning in 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 solo queue. Um, so, uh, you know, otherwise you have things like Karma. If you look at, like, Challenger, Pickban, uh, like, Karma, Lulu are, are all top dogs here. Um, and so less gold generation, less, less free mana. So and maybe they will just, you know, they'll just go Relic Shield or whatnot, but... Okay, they're not getting their support item right away. So um, I think these are very good changes. I think slowing this down is, is a really, really big deal. Um, I will say that specifically, I'm the one who rec who um, suggested the charge time one. Uh, certainly, the designer was already trying to lower the gold value because the 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 highs were just like... It was overall doing too well, to be clear. Um, but it was also really hard to get good, clean numbers for the like amount of nerf the designer wanted. And I was like, hey, what about charge generation goes down? I don't know if I said like two or four seconds or what. I, he picked the number. Um but liked the suggestion, and so uh, 10 becomes 12 seconds. And again, best case for Spell Thieves and Frostfang is going to be going to be worse. Magical Footwear, just simply 30% um, of the cell cost. So you're only getting, you know, a little bit of gold out of this one. Uh, this was uh, Yumi Tech. I think it was probably better, honestly, to run Futures Market instead. But taking Footwear to sell it, obviously, is pretty troll. Um, this was uh, the case of Biscuits a while ago as well, where you would run Biscuits and just sell Biscuits on Recall. Um, you'd still get the max mana for it, and you just, like, get better Recalls for it. Um, I think Futures Market is is fine, right? That's what the rune is about. It's literally here, get free gold. Um, Treasure Hunter, to a certain degree, also, right? That here, the, the whole point is free gold. Getting footwear or the stopwatch or biscuits to get gold, not the point of the rune. So, I mean, I think good to make this change. Treasure Hunter is just getting straight up nerfed. The rune definitely is overpowered. I think design-wise, it's a really cool rune. I like it. I think it's really cool. It is a good replacement for Ravenous Hunter uh, from back when, but... Uh, the rune is just OP, so it's just simply 20 less gold per bounty, so 550 becomes 450 total gold. Very simple stuff here, but I think a very well-deserved nerf and and good stuff there. We go on to jungle adjustments. Um, 
The Rift Herald Leash Range is up a little bit. It can take it a little bit farther out, but it no longer has the soft reset state, which means now if you want to go in and say, ah, I'm going to mess with you and make you reset Herald, and you've got to either hard stick to Herald, you can't cut it out and then like chase me away and then get back to it. Um, soft reset is gone. It's simply a hard reset. Uh, running back to the original position. This, I think, definitely does quite a bit for um, spicing up Herald fights a bit. You have that tech again of forcing the reset and having it heal back up. Uh, pretty big stuff there. Um, overall, Gromp is very, very tanky. And Gromp having less health, though certainly um, th the most sort of common three camp builds are something like Red Blue Gromp or like Full Blue Quadrant in a lot of cases. Um, of course, that gets a little bit faster to the tune of 150 health, but considering that um, Jungle Monster health scales off of its level 1 health, um, this is an overall continual um, hastening to full clear speeds. Um, so this is, is a little tap in the direction of, hey, this is an outlier in terms of durability. Grump takes a while to kill. It's pretty lethal. Um, full clearing is going to have a little bit less time taking killing its camps. Grump's a little bit dead faster. That's kind of nice. Um, hey, by the way, monster kills give you five more health. This can be increased pretty substantially based on how much missing health you have. I think it's like up to triple or something. Um, so every camp gives you five fifty more health. Again, full clearing gives you a little bit healthier now. It's going to be looking a little bit nicer. Um, it's going to look a little bit better there. Um, oh, up to 2.25. There you go. So up to, up to what? 11.25, something like that. Um, more health per, per uh, camp you kill. Um, some very, very small clear speed changes. Functionally, the AP ratio is down very slightly here. Um, I remember doing the math on this stuff back in preseason when I was still a professional shoutcaster. Um, and uh, I noticed that the ability power ratio was definitely one of the nicer looking changes here. Um, certainly the, the bonus health armor MR1 is still really strong. Uh, but to be fair, tanks kind of need it for having any clear speed at all. Uh, but AP ratio down a little bit. It's just going to be a very, very tight, uh, a light touchdown. Right? Again, Demonic Embrace not killing the dragon and stuff quite as fast. AP junglers are you know pretty much all the top dogs. So I think pretty solid systemic hit here as well. But again, it's not a very big deal. It's just a very, very, very light touch. Um, now the coolest one of this patch to me are the next two things here. So... Um, Overall XP gain for killing the enemy champion is going down um, for most of the early game. Um, we'll get to the actual numbers in a little bit, but a pretty substantial drop in the amount of XP you gain from killing an enemy champion or assisting in the kill of an enemy champion in the early game. There was also a big drop in the amount of XP you gain um, for being underleveled. So let's talk about that. So champion kill XP. You still get 42 XP for killing level 1 champion. And you still get 114 for killing level 2 champion. But from levels 3 through 9, the amount of XP you get is now substantially lower. And you can see percentage-wise, right? It's, it's down 20 to 30, even in some cases 40%. And then finally, you know, catches back up around level 9, 10 when we're kind of out of the early game. We're back into regular sort of regular-sized team fights. Um, but in terms of the amount of flat XP difference, this is how much difference it is. And in some cases, like, this is like a camp's worth of XP difference. Like, this is like a very, very big deal. Um... And so the the value of a kill is down. Obviously, it still grants gold. Keep in mind, at everyone's cases, this is 450 gold. 450 gold, right? Because 300 for the kill, 150 assist. So 450 gold, 450 gold, 450 gold, 450 gold. And, and you know, pretty quickly, a similar amount of experience. Um, now it's not a similar amount of experience until much later on in the game. Um, pretty substantial value drop in the value of a kill. Um, pretty substantial stuff here. Now, again, also, there is a multiplier for how much extra XP you get for being underleveled compared to the one that you killed. Um, which is pretty frequent if, as a jungler, you're like, oh yeah, um, you know, I'm just gonna, like, kill three camps gank mid. I'm just gonna keep ignoring my topside jungle and just keep, you know, camping mid and bot and looking for kills that way. And I'm gonna get underleveled, but don't worry about it, because as soon as I show up to any team fight ever, I'm just gonna get a shit ton of free experience and off we go to the races. Um, so now, when you kill a champion of this level and you are down one level, here's how much XP it actually gave you. Here's how much it gives you now. And it's substantially lower. You're getting half the XP. If you are killing a level 6 champion on level 5, the amount of XP you're getting is literally half what it was before. That is a very big cut to kill level 6 champions level 5 champion, which, by the way, is any jungler ganking mid, unless you got Giga ahead. Um, if you're down two levels, it's this. Um... Right um, now, to be fair, it it the the amount softens because it was um, sixteen, then thirty two, then forty eight, then fifty four, then eighty. What sixty four, then eighty, um, and now it's zero zero, 
or sorry, 0, 20, 40, 60, 80. So once you are five levels behind, the catch-up XP is no longer any different. Um, but this definitely does a lot for this. Now, this will, by the way, lower support levels by quite a bit because supports are frequently down levels. But supports are frequently, right, not down one level, not down two levels, but down like three or four levels where the difference is, is not nearly as large. The, the, the amount of combat XP difference is going to be substantially, substantially cut down. Um, the, the, difference, right, the difference is going to very quickly become zero. Um, so this doesn't affect supports nearly as much. It will affect them some, of course. Um, but this definitely affects Jungle Code a lot. And again, what this does is this changes the calculus of do I clear, do I gank? Because if you gank, the literal reward for ganking is lower. The literal reward for ganking is lower. Um, the amount of catch-up XP you get for being underleveled because you skipped camps is lower. Um, if you choose to clear, the camps die faster and heal you for more. So I think really, really cool changes directionally all very awesome for making clearing as the jungler um, quite a bit nicer than simply um, spam ganking. Will this be perfect? Will this be, we've done it, every number is now perfect and, and the jungle meta is perfect now? Probably not. But I think every single one of those changes is directionally really, really awesome, which is cool to see. Let's do a quick TLDR of patch 13.4. It's a pretty big one. We've got a lot of changes into this patch. Let's talk about what's going on here. So Ari getting a simple increase of 20 health and 3 armor and 10 seconds off her R cooldown. Pretty solid buff here. You know, a um, couple win percent here. Uh, I think overall, Ari will be relatively a strong champion. Pretty cool changes. Nothing too spicy to talk about here. Just going to be a relatively strong champion. Um, Alistair is follow-up off of the 13.3 changes where it ended up being a nerf to the champion overall. Um, this is functionally returning his teammate heal values back to where they were before. Um, assuming he can get like a decent number of items on a regular clip. Um, this should bring his winner back to where it was. Uh, very small AP ratio buffs. Uh, we are nowhere close, as far as I could tell, to Wizard Cow actually being any good. But the simple AP ratio buffs help items like Shirelia's and, and you know, circumstances like Baron buff and, and Relic Shield uh, and stat shards make it feel a little bit better and a bit more worth considering getting stat shards. Mimu is a really, really high win rate jungler right now, um, especially too good in lower MMRs. Um, late game scaling stats that don't require any input from you tend to be low MMR skewed uh, power. So health growth, armor growth, and then uh, late ranks of W are all getting weaker. This should be a pretty strong one and a half maybe almost 2% win rate nerf to um, jungle at Mumu in lower ranks. And he'll still be very strong, but less so. And they getting pretty simple changes. Health growth and armor growth are down. These are going to be solo queue skewed nerfs. Not huge stuff, but we'll lower win rate a little bit. Annie losing 34 health, uh, losing 5 to uh, 25 off the shield. Uh, sorry, off the shield's retaliation damage. Going to be pretty felt. And then um, 0 to 20 seconds, or sorry, 10 to 20 seconds cooldown increase on Tibbers here as well. Um, also going to be pretty meaningful. Aphelios is getting an extra 1.5% bonus XP per rank in his W passive. Uh, this ends up being um, hopefully enough to make maxing W and E second competitive with one another so that he can choose if he has to go frontline to go max W. If he's going to go kill Squish, he can max E and choose the attack speed versus the lethality. And it can hopefully be a compelling choice and just another avenue for skill expression out of Aphelios instead of just you always max E second. As you get 100 less mana at level 1, it breaks even at level 9. Uh, one second longer soldier recharge at W, and then to compensate these nerfs, um, 0 to 40 extra damage on E with a 0.15 higher AP ratio, and uh, 25 to 125 more damage in R with a 0.15 AP ratio increase there as well. Um, the hope is that this is actually going to be win rate positive in low MMR, but overall um, lower pro present because he's going to be much less of a lane bully. Trigger gets a very little bit of extra armor growth, um, 10 mana cost off Q, 0 to 20 mana cost off W, and 0 to 20 damage increase on Q here as well. Uh, pretty simple stuff though, but certainly having much less uh, mana cost rates is going to be pretty meaningful. If he doesn't have to go um, mana flow band anymore, this could be pretty valuable. Keep in mind he gets some free mana via his passive as well. Some kind of cool stuff here, so, um, you know, pretty simple, but nice. Trigger gets changes would feel pretty good. Elise gets 10 to 30 damage off of her melee Q. And um, 2, 1, 0, and then plus 1 damage uh, changed on spider form. Spiderlings, um, a little bit of early game nerf overall. Um, she is one of the absolute queens of pro play right now and a huge deal in high MMR as well. So um, down goes somewhat the early game AP jungler. Jarvan was too good from the 13.3 buff, so they're walking them back somewhat. Um, one second cooldown getting added back to the W. I believe this will cut from 10 to 8. Now it's back to 9. Um, AD ratio was 0.8. It's cut a little bit down to 0.7. Jarvan, of course, still buffed compared to the previous patch, just less egregiously strong. 
Shax loses 10, uh, loses 20 health, gets one more health growth, still a pretty minor nerf. Um, now all the E damage gets doubled if you uh, dodge four attacks, um, including the AP ratio, which did get nerfed a little bit, but it's still up to 1.4 if you get all the dodges. So still pretty strong here, but the big thing is that the uh, percent max health damage is now 8% on full dodge, which is of course a strict buff for the champion um, in most of his common builds. On hit damage, minus 20, minus 10, and the same. And the bonus armor on first champion hit, minus 10, minus 5, and the same, which is 60% um, of that uh, as bonus MR. So certainly um, nerf, nerf, and nerf, and then a very, very slight buff. Jack's overall going to lose somewhere in this patch. Malphite, pretty substantial buff here. Two seconds off the W cooldown. 5% armor on the W and 5% armor on the W. Um, substantial, pretty increase to the amount of damage it can deal. Cool stuff there. Maokai, a couple of changes here. So the biggest one is a four-second cooldown increase to Sapling Toss, which is going to do a lot for the amount that you can actually try to control the map as Sapling Spam in the jungle. Keep my junglers have infinite mana um, because of how much region you get from your uh, jungle items. So uh, cooldown is really the only um, spell-gating lever that is available for junglers. A very small base damage increase, a moderate ability power ratio decrease here as well. Uh, should lower, right, the, you know, the cooldown is worse, the damage is slightly, substantially worse, and the... Um, Slow per ability power, also um, pretty meaningfully worse here on Sapling Toss. So pretty heavily felt here changes to what Sapling Toss is going to do to AP Maokai. Cooldown worse, damage worse, um, and slow. All of those are worse. If you're playing tank Maokai and you're stacking health instead, um, cooldown is still worse. Damage is a much less nerf because you keep the bonus health ratio. Um, and the actual slow is going to be increased for him, plus a little bit more base damage on um, the Q. It's not a substantial increase. It ends up being about 0 to 7% more damage on Q. A little bit less of your ability power because that's not going to increase any. But overall, definitely shifts, shifts the champion around a little bit. Um, he's probably still going to be plenty strong as a tank. He's going to be much weaker as a um, AP champ, which is all well and good. Honestly, um, I'm not convinced that I should have shipped this buff to Q. I think, honestly, the champ could have just done with a loss to win rate overall, but uh, I think it's reasonable to go here and then and then take stock and then, you know, pivot again if we have to, but um, I think it's a reasonable set of changes regardless. Orianna gets three more base armor and 10 mana cost off her W. Pretty simple changes, but of course, uh, solid buff there. Riven gets a pretty substantial increase amount of damage that her pass is going to deal as bonus damage. It's, 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 this ends up being a, uh, somewhere around um, like 5 to 17% more damage from the passive itself, like the amount of damage the passive adds um, by itself, and of course, keep in mind that also um, this deals some damage to turrets now as a new thing. So uh, that's going to also be pretty nice. This allows Riven to really embrace being a split pusher and going pretty hard for that avenue. So I think really cool changes here to Riven. I think really, really smart changes by the designer who did this stuff. Samira is going to be a much less snowball early game champion. She's going to have less move speed via her passive until level 16, where it finally goes a bit higher. But this ends up being about 12% less move speed on a fully stacked passive at levels 1 through 5, uh, which is pretty meaningful, and it's still around like 8% less move speed, level 6 through 10. So much less snowball in the early game. Um, less lifesteal effectiveness on the R as well for snowballiness as well. So a lot less snowballiness, which hopefully should lower frustration a ton for um, Samira. Uh, she is probably... So I, I want to keep her winner above 50%. I think she is allowed to have a solid win rate. She's a really cool champion. She's really popular. There's no reason to punish champion for that. Um, but I was trying to remove frustration where possible without trying to make her a bad champion. Uh, right? I'm not trying to make her sub-50. I'm trying to make her less frustrating, uh, which means that people who are frustrated by Samira are less frustrated. And Samira players... She's not banned, and they can just play the champion that they enjoy, right? And everyone can win. So that's, that's the hope here. Um, he's really, really, really trying to go for frustration if possible. Senna gets really, really massive buffs here. Uh, base uh, attack de attack speed ratio is a really big deal as a lever, especially when it's changed by this much. And this ends up being around um, 0 to 8% more attack speed with lethality builds, but it's like 0 to 20% more attack speed in um, attack speed builds. It's a really, really big deal there. So Kraken Slayer Senna is, I think, unironically, like a 4% win rate bump. Um... I think it's a really big deal. Now, Krakens Air Senna is hard dog shit. Um, it is crusty. It, it, you know, it's, it, it's, it's hard dog shit. Um, so it's, it's going to be in the realm of possibility once again. Uh, R getting um, 0 to 50 base damage, but also a 0.15 bonus AD ratio. Keep in mind that her souls are bonus AD, so she gets quite a bit there. It's going to feel quite good. 20 seconds the R cooldown, also pretty meaningful. These are very, very big Senna buffs. I think Senna is going to be the biggest winner of the patch. And speaking of winners, Thrash was not winning enough after the changes. Um, much like Alistair, where I took some away when I added other stuff, Thrash ended up losing win rate because of nerfing um, uh, nerfing the amount of uh, shielding that Dark Passage uh, got per soul. So pulling that one down a little bit. Um, 
and say, okay, let's try to ship more Struck buffs. The goal here is still to, um, once again, make Qmax and Emax better than Wmax. I'm happy with Dark Passage being a good skill, but I want W to be a good 1-point wonder. Um, that, is, I, that is my ideal here. I want W to be a good 1-point wonder, not a good ability max first. To me, Thresh is a spicy, exciting hook champion. If his power is melee range flays, landing multiple hooks, getting in close, throwing down the box, doing a bunch of really cool stuff, that's a better version of the champion. So 0 to 20 and 0.1 AP ratio increase on death sentence, and a 0 to 2 second cooldown buff on the Q is spicy and really strong. If you have modern amounts of haste, you can chain Q into a new Q. It's really good stuff. This is really, really strong. I mean, I really think this puts Thresh in a really good spot in pro play. Uh, but keep in mind, you have to make up the fact that they have to get rid of their old max ability. They have to go from W max into Q max, which was like a, like a 3 to 4% win rate drop, depending on how you measured it. Um, so you have to make up that much winner difference, which is like kind of tough to do. Um, e max, I don't think it really needed a ton of help, but uh, this is to help make sure that E max is better than W max. Um, I'm fine if it's E max first instead of Q max first, but like I really, really want Q and E in some order to be the correct abilities for him. Um, if it still doesn't happen, I'm gonna go even. I'm gonna keep going. I, I, every single freaking patch, man. I will, I will come in and I will make sure that W max is not the right ability. Um, because I, I, I am, I'm so sure that Thresh is a better champion if Q and E max are the better ability. So that's what we're doing with this one. I think it's gonna be really cool stuff, and hopefully. We actually get there, and Qmax Emax is correct. Udyr loses some health growth, loses some base armor. Pretty minor stuff here, uh, but of course a little bit less tanky. Uh, bonus damage on hit off of Q. Increase slow off of uh, Empowered R. Uh, we're at a point now where Qmax and R Max Udyr are pretty similar win rates, but he is just simply too good right now. So pretty simple nerfs onto him. Spicy changes to Vagar. 10 increased range on Q. 50 increased range on W. Really cool stuff. I like the standards a lot. I think really clever stuff by the game designer who did this. Um, I think it's really cool. I think Vagar players are really happy. They have, you know, more long-range tools that they can kind of help keep things at bay because his selfish defensive tools are really, really weak. Vega is not doing very well in uh, solo queue, and he's not in pro play very much as well. Uh, but I think the healthiest version of Viego is one where his builds are squishy. I think... Um, Divine Sunderer, Dead Man's Plate, GA is not a healthy build. I mean, it's literally a healthy build, but it's not healthy for the game. Uh, this is a champ who heals off of killing champions, who resets and turns untargetable, who resets an ult cooldown. Anytime a reset champion gets to build tanky, I think that champion is flawed for the game. Um, I think reset champions need to live on a knife's edge, building damage, remaining squishy, and that is how these champions are allowed to function in the game. Um... That is my very strong belief on, on that kind of kit interaction. And so the Q damage can now crit. So your buff is only if you build Kraken Slayer or Shield Bow or um, Essence Reaver or, you know, one of those items. Um, and Heartseeker damage now scales even more aggressively off of bonus AD. Uh, again, this is meant to be strict buffs. He is weak right now. So if you do your current builds and you're doing like, you know, Divine Sender or Full Tank, you still get a little something out of it, but only a little. Uh, whereas if you're going Kraken, if you're going Shield Bow, if you're going Essence Reaver, you're going these kind of items, um, you're going to feel it a lot more. You're going to feel it out of getting more bonus AD and going this way. So... Really cool stuff there. I like this. I think those are really clever changes. Um, and I think this is really nice. Demonic Embrace is now capped against monsters. This does not matter a ton. This mostly only matters against Baron, Rift Herald, and Dragon. Um, it'll matter a very, very little bit. I think it's like red, blue, and gromp, but like by such a small imagine that it just doesn't matter. Um, so it's nice that there is a cap here. I think it's wise that there is a cap, but very, very minor stuff. Door Shield nerfed pretty heavily. 12 for 5 seconds is... Um, this is uh, 24 health per minute, uh, which is not actually massive, but of course it matters some. Um, yeah, it's a bit weaker. Relic Shield and Targon's Buckler have more health regen. Spectral Sickle and Spell Thieves uh, generate gold charges less frequently, and the, specifically the AP ones have less mana regen. Pretty big swing here in pushing down ranged champions and buffing melee ones. Honestly, this is a pretty solid lever for, like, just generically buffing melee and nerfing ranged. Um... I could have thought of doing this and didn't when I did a bunch of melee and range support changes in the previous patch. I decided to go for um, specific interesting champion buffs. Um, I think this is also a pretty reasonable way to go about it. But uh, I also think, by the way, that like tr strictly for the health of the game, like overall, like good design values for the game, this is a really, really good change for the game um, because um, people were getting their, their Wardstone combine way faster on range than melee champions. Um, especially in, like, the top, like, you know, 10, 20, you know, 25 percentile, the, 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 the good edge cases. Um, 
And it's like, well, your ultra good edge case is going to be hit pretty heavily here by, you know, 20%. Uh, whereas an average case is not nerfed quite as hard. So, like, this nerf looks pretty big on paper. It's not that big of a deal, ultimately. Um, of course, it still matters to get me wrong. And, of course, the Menogen, of course, matters quite a bit as well. You can't select Magical Footwear for um, remotely close to full value. Magical Footwear is no longer a gold-generating rune. So we have gold-generating rune, Treasure Hunter, of course, nerfed by up to 100 gold here as well, which is a somewhat jungle skewed nerf because junglers get around the map and involve themselves in more stuff. I mean, Treasure Hunter is certainly OP, and it's certainly part of how junglers are OP because they have the most access to hunter runes, and this is just absurdly snowball-y, of course. Right? If you gank bot to a double kill and you get to recall at uh, getting an extra 120 gold, that's just absurdly massive and just makes you so much better than the other jungler who didn't get that gank off. Um, and it's just, it snowballs in itself so hard. Keep in mind that most AD carries also run Treasure Hunter. Um, they just run Eyeball Collect Treasure Hunter, and so they get like two bonus AD and also 120 bonus gold. And it's like, oh, the game ended because we double killed Ganked Bot. We generated 420, or uh, so we generated 240 bonus gold and Eyeball Collector for the AD carry. And ooh, it's just, this is the giga over, right? So generally a fan here. I think this is good stuff. Um, jungle adjustments, leash range on Rift Herald is a little bit longer, but it no longer has a soft reset. So now you can go mess with Herald takes and get to, get to reset it. And just, there's just more sort of room for contest here. I think it's really cool. Uh, Gromp overall level is durable. So, uh, this is just one camp with a bit less health. So full clearers have a, a little bit less time spent killing one of the harder camps in the game. Um, the base heal that monsters give you. has been increased by five as well. So your full clears give you more health back. So you're a bit healthier finishing a full clear. Generally can be pretty positive there as well. Um, a little bit of an AP ratio nerf for the jungle item. It's not going to be a very big deal, but it is there. The really big one is that kill XP is down between level 3 and 9. And comeback kill XP is down substantially as well. Um, this ends up being a really, really big deal. Flashbang warning. Here is the at level kill XP difference. In terms of percentage and flat. This is a pretty meaningful drop. Keep in mind that uh, this is, you know... This would be split amongst everyone, but, like, this means that, you know, you gank bot and get a kill at level 4, you're printing 84 less free experience to your team, right? There's just less experience given out. Also, if you if you kill a level 4 mid laner as a level 3 jungler, and you're a level behind, and you kill a level 4 champion, it's even substantially worse, right? It's, instead of it being, you know, 30%, 33% less XP, it's it's um 42% less XP, because you're not getting... The, that self amp as much, right? You're not getting uh, as much self amp uh, if you're down two levels. It's a little bit, it's a little bit softer. Um, as you're farther and farther down in levels, um, it gets softer and softer and softer, which makes this nerf um, not affect supports as much, but certainly does affect the junglers who are um, pretty repeatedly getting down in levels, and then getting a PvP combat and whatnot. So this this does quite a bit in lowering the value of turbo ganking as a jungler um, and making. You know, sacrificing those ganks to go for farm a bit nicer. Directionally, really, really good changes in terms of making this, um, you know, directionally better for healthier, not gank spam jungling. All right, that's the patch rundown. Thanks for tuning in. Goodbye, everyone.